Okay, the M1 Grand Rifle. <clears throat> I'm not really going to do a video about the history or how to operate it. I'm going to kind of give you a buyer's guide and collector's reference on this particular gun. I've owned three or four different ones over the years. And, you know, when I was younger, I never bought pristine grade guns. I bought some in the 90s when they came out of Korea, a bunch of Garands and uh, carbines came out of Korea at that period of time were available widely on the surplus market. And they were pretty much in miserable shape. I had one good example uh, that I, I sold a carbine and I had a, a rifle that was kind of okay. I didn't really have a lot of money into it. But uh, there were problems with it, and I'll go over that. Uh, the one thing you have to be concerned about too is this is kind of this rifle is kind of particular about the kind of ammo you put in it. But the M1 Garand, I'll do a brief history, was uh, designed by an engineer named John Garand. He was from Canada, and this gun was developed in the, through the 20s, and by the late 30s he perfected it. The problem at that time with all semi-automatic guns, no matter who was designing them, is um, the cartridge is, is long, huge, and powerful. And in the 20s, they were trying to design a semi-automatic gun with a smaller cartridge, smaller caliber. And Douglas MacArthur, it was uh, Pedersen or Penderson, um, rifle was being developed. And at that time, in the 20s, General MacArthur said, no, whatever gun you're designing, it's going to be calibered in a 30 odd 6 and that's it. No exceptions. And that kind of put the end on a lot of the programs. Well, we came up with this gun, <clears throat> and for the time, probably was the most successful semi-automatic rifle uh, from World War II. The Germans had two different types and variations which were problematic in their own ways. The, uh, there was a 1941 and then a 43. Um, you know, I've never owned one, either one, but they weren't made in large numbers. I don't know if it's because it's complicated. They, they, they weren't successful. See, where the Germans come up with the idea is use a small scale cartridge and a compact gun and you know they're the ones that come up with that idea that worked and instead of making something that fires these giant 30 odd 6 or 303's uh, a lot of countries tried to take their bolt action guns and modify them with rods and pistons and make them semi-automatic I was never successful so this gun kind of held its own at the time it was a top of the line, I guess, or top of the list. Uh, the Russians did have the Tober Wreck, which, from what I see of people shooting them, they, they don't really function that well or that reliable. I don't know, maybe they do. I've never owned one of those either. <clears throat> um, the gun stayed in service from 1938, they adopted it, until 1957, when it was replaced by the M14. Now, they made a bunch of them in World War II, and then as they were overhauling them and re-arsenaling the guns, they realized they were coming up short, and there was another production run in the early 50s during the Korean War. I think International Harvester and Harrington and Richardson made the guns, not so much Springfield Armory. Or maybe they did. I'm, I'm not quite sure. You can't hold me to that one. But uh, that was the last production run was in the early 50s. So what the government would do is they would uh, refurbish these guns, rebarrel them, replace the parts, <coughs> re-arsenal them. The gun stayed in service till 1957 until it was replaced by the M14. So these guns were worn, and I talked to guys in the service in the mid-50s that told me some of the guns they were shooting were worn out and, and beat up, and they'd go and qualify on a range, couldn't hit nothing, and you know. And also, these weapons were given away as military aid to Greece. Uh, I think Denmark or Norway was given them. There was a bunch of them sent to South America 
the Koreans, I guess, when we were in Korea and we stayed there since the war has never ended, it's only an armistice. So when troops would go over there, like my father did in 55 or 56, what they did is they just left all the equipment there. So you got on a transport ship, you went there, and you were issued a rifle from the arsenal over there. And that's where the guns stayed. Actually, the Koreans recently, a few years ago, had some of these left in reserve as permission from President Obama to sell them. He gave it to them, and they did not ever show up. I don't know what happened. We're not importing guns anymore. So, uh, a couple things to look for. If you're buying one of these at a gun show, <clears throat> this particular rifle I got from what I used to call a DCM. Now it's a CMP, uh, Civilian Marksmanship Program. And when I ordered this gun, they had an option there. You can order a gun with no wood. And it was a little bit less, so I, I ordered it. And I had to wait about four or five months, but they sent me a rifle that was a complete rifle without the wooden stock. It was come in a little box like this, the butt plate, all the stuff was there. All the parts are there, but there was no wood. I don't know. So then I go, all right, I'll just go get a stock. Then there was a time you couldn't find them. So when I shot this gun, I, I had a couple others, of Korean uh, surplus ones. I took the wood off of that and fired this gun once. I fooled around with my other ones more, and they had some issues, and I ended up selling them, and I kept this gun here. So I really haven't fired this much. Uh, when you're buying these, there's certain things to check out, and a lot of guys, this is a very popular rifle, a lot of people have accessories for them. One of them is, you got little gauges to check where. And what it is, a little gauge, you'll have rings and numbers on it, you stick it in the muzzle, and if it's from zero to one, it's almost like a new barrel. And I know guys that can go in, if it goes to two or three or whatever, they can tell you how many rounds or how much wear there is. There are also, which a lot of the armor tools, you used to be able to get them. There's uh, throat erosion gauges, headspace gauges, and everything else. The only good thing is if you get one of these and it's kind of worn out, there are several places that can rebuild you one of these rifles right back, you know, as long as your receiver isn't damaged. Um, can rebuild these guns right back to where they're brand new. And they do shoot. They're still very popular with long range rifle shooters, you know, up to a thousand yards. Um, the 30 odd six can handle that. If you got a good barrel, and you can get barrels heavy match barrels, medium weight barrels, or service barrels, whatever you want. They're still a very, very popular gun in competition high power rifle shooters. And it's still in use much today. And you can get newly manufactured versions of this gun. <coughs> but a lot of us are collectors. <coughs> if you run across one, I'll show you what to look for. This particular gun was made towards the end of the war, I think either the last year or, uh, in, or a year or two after the war before the contracts ran off. And it has still some of the old greenish parkerizing on there that's worn. So I don't believe this gun, when uh, they refinished them, it had more of a gray color or the World War II style uh, Parkerized finished will turn this kind of greenish, dull color over time. So we'll take a look at it and I'll point out some things for you to look for when you're buying one of these guns. Okay, like I said, they have a little gauge that goes in here. You can measure the barrel erosion. And most of the problems that you'll have is if the guns are worn out. Some of them ones that came from Korea like the uh, M1 carbines and that, they were worn out because the M1 carbine has a little latch here, a little button latch that will hold the bolt open and that can be worn out and uh, that. So you kind of want to look at your receipts. You can see there's wear on this gun where the finish is rubbed off. 
and you want to look the stock fits on there pretty good. Another problem you can have, and the one gun I got from the Korean surplus had this problem, there's a pin that runs through here in this latch and when you want to pull the action open you hit this and it releases the uh, cartridges in the gun. There's a pin that runs through here onto this and this has got a little spring underneath. This part of the receiver either the stock would be too far out, there would be a gap in here and when this pin gets worn over time it'll move out so you'll be firing the rifle the pin will move out and then it tries to eject in the clip when it goes back in the recoil and jams the gun up. The guy told me just to go and glue some water, build this up, and, and keep the pin from moving. But uh, and it only has to come out a little way. Because if that slides out of there and this thing disengages, I don't know, that's a little over a quarter inch. If that moves a little, then the gun will jam on you. Another thing that happens, and like I said, when we go into reloading, is the op rod. Okay, this is your gas tube here, and there's a hole. If you disassemble this gun and take this off, the little hole for the gas is tapped off here. It goes into this tube, and I'll take the op rod out and show it to you. Now, you got a plug here, and on these, it's either solid or... When you put a grenade launching device, there's a the pin will go in there, there's a little valve in there that you depress it and it cuts off the gas. So with a grenade firing blank, the whole charge uh, of the blank cartridge will go to the grenade and not activate the gas system. You have to operate this manually when launching grenades with the grenade launcher attached. Those are two pr <coughs> problems. Now I'll take it apart and show you the op rod. Okay, now we got it apart, I'll show you the problem. This here, if you notice this, when you press this down, notice some parts move. This is all connected in the mechanism. And right in there is a pin that goes across, holds this into the receiver, and there's a spring under that latch. And this gets worn or loose and your stock isn't tight, it'll slip out and then the whole mechanism while you're firing, it usually happens when you're shooting, uh, it, it jams the gun up. So basically that's one problem you have with these when they get a little worn out. And now the next thing is our op rod, which is here. And you see it goes down, there's your tube. And we'll move it. See where at the full recoil, it's still in there. All right, so we'll get the rod out, and basically you just kind of slip it up off the bolt and get it out of there. Okay, here's the op rod out of the uh, gun. This one don't look so hot as it is. This may be bent itself. I'm not sure. But we'll take it out and fire it and see if we can get the gun to work. That's what you're worried about. Is because all it is is a slender little tube hooked into this here and your recoil spring goes in there. And once your op rod gets bent, the gun probably won't work well. And that could happen from ammunition or whatever. This one looks like it's beat to crap. I think it did function the last time I fired it. But I guess we will find out here soon. Because this gun here does have wear. It doesn't look like it's ever been refinished. But there is, you know, wear in it. So it could be a good sign, could be a bad sign. We'll find out. Like I said, I only fired this a little bit. I really don't know. I guess we'll make some ammo and give it a test and see if we run into any problems. So... That's basically our look at the M1 Garand. And like I said, I wasn't going to give you a complete history, just kind of some advice on what to look for uh, when you're buying one of these and some of the problems you'll run into. Alright, so now I'll get this back together, clean it up, make sure it's ready to be fired, and we'll make some ammo.